Good evening, and welcome to this UEA London lecture. Uh, my name is Anthony Howe, Professor of Modern History, and I'm deputising this evening for Katie Cubitt, Head of the School of History, who is unable to be with us. Uh, but I'm delighted to see so many alumni, friends and supporters here this evening. And a warm welcome, too, to those joining us via the live stream. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to make a small request of you. We will be sending a brief survey out via email to canvas your views on tonight's event. It would help us very much in planning future lectures if you could take the time uh, to tell us what you think, politely. Uh, if any of you are on Twitter, I'd encourage you to tweet your thoughts about tonight's talk using the hashtag UEA Live Lecture. Now, for the benefit of those of you who, like me, are new to these lectures, the format will be roughly as follows. Lindsay will speak for approximately 45 minutes, then there will be time for questions, and finally, we hope that you'll join us for a drink in the foyer. Now, to introduce our speaker. Lindsay is Professor of Modern Literature and History in the School of History at UEA. Her research focuses on 20th century literature and history, human rights and refugee studies. She adopts a question-driven approach and her work draws upon the connections between literature, history, politics and law. Uh, in 2016, Lindsay was awarded the British Academy Rose Mary Crawshay Prize for her book, The Judicial Imagination, Writing After Nuremberg. Uh, taking the work of the political theorist Hannah Arendt as a theoretical starting point, the book considered the relationship between law, justice, and literature in the aftermath of total war and genocide. And it focused on the work of an extraordinary generation of women writers and intellectuals, including Rebecca West, Martha Gellhorn, Elizabeth Bowen, Dorothy Thompson, Muriel Spark, and Iris Murdoch. Uh, but it is Arendt's arguments about statelessness and human rights that form the core of Lindsay's new book, from which her lecture tonight takes its title, Placeless People, Writing, Rights and Refugees. This book is a polemical study of how the literature of exile gave way to a more complicated and vexed articulation of statelessness. And it's due to be published in October this year. Uh, Lindsay's current work also focuses on how writing plays a role in contemporary refugee communities. Uh, and in that context, she has recently visited both the Lebanon and Jordan. Uh, she is also the co-editor of the mid-century series for Oxford University Press and is currently writing a, a short book uh, punningly entitled Writing with a capital W and writing with a capital R, Literature in the Age of Human Rights. Please join me now in welcoming Lindsay to give the London Lecture. Thank you, Tim. If I talk like this, can you all hear me? Um, you can. If, because um, I'm a woman with very strong opinions, but I can talk quite quietly and quite quickly. Uh, I would like you to be able to hear. I just want to thank you all um, for coming. I was about to say thank you all for coming when you could have been on this very balmy evening, sitting somewhere quietly, drinking something cool. But I noticed some of you are drinking <laughs> something, which is making me very jealous. I also want to thank um, our marvellous alumni team at UEA who do such a fantastic job of keeping our community together and are wonderful organisers. 
Um, I've got one of the best jobs in the world. As you'll have heard Tony say, I'm a professor in modern literature and modern history. I get to teach both. I get to talk to history students about literature, and I get to talk to literature students about history. Now, as this is an alumni um, event, some of this will sound very familiar. Can I just see who was in the old... Put your hand up if you were in the old EAS. Yes, my job's just got much easier. Uh, <laughs> put your hand up if I taught you. Oh, OK. <laughs> Great. I'm not sure if that's made my job more difficult. You might have heard some of this before. Now, those of you who were in the old EAS will remember that there was this thing called prelims in the first year. And every student, no matter what your major was, you had to do a bit of literature and you had to do a bit of history. That was one of the requirements of the then very new UEA. And that was designed... That um, program, that syllabus, was designed by a guy called Ian Watt, who some of you might have known. He, went on, he wrote this brilliant book about the 18th century novel and individualism. And he thought it was really important that all students in the humanities had the capacity to understand how history is made and to read literature. There's a, another critic, a more recent cricket, critic called Elaine Skerry, who I'm very fond of, and she has this, this is an essay she wrote on Orwell several years ago. And she said, there are two things you need to be able to do in order to think. One is to identify what is accurately there, and one is to be able to imagine what's not there, what it might imagine, you know, someone else's feelings, what might have happened. And then she says the two names for these things are literature and history. Now, Ian Watt had a rather more um, um, brutal um, reason for um, deciding that everybody in EAS, his new... Um, new school of humanities. Remember, this is 64. In what was in a prison of war camp in the Far East, he was one of the guys who built the bridge over the River Kwai. He was in um, a prison of war camp for a long time, for two years. And he was a young man. He was an undergraduate. He'd gone back and started his PhD. He'd been drafted. He'd ended up in a prison of war camp. And while he was in the prison of war camp, um, he started teaching with a couple of other guys, the prisoners in the camp, to keep them going. And the two things they insisted on teaching were literature and history. And the reason they did that was they thought, that when, you're, when you're in a prison of war camp, or I might say some refugee camps, or concentration camps, you are stripped of your humanity. That's the point of those camps. So Ian wanted to teach history because it's really important to give people a place in time. That's a humanizing narrative, to give them a place in historical narratives. So anyone who could would teach history. And he wanted to teach literature because he wanted to keep the imagination of what it meant to be human at a time when um, people were being thoroughly dehumanized. So one of the ironies of becoming a UEA student is, you know, um, basically we teach the same curriculum as you get in a prison of war camp <laughs> in the 1940s. Um, and you know, a lot of this, Marina Mackay, who's a, um, a, a now a scholar at Oxford, is just, she's publishing a book about this um, next year. She's another UEA alumni. But the really important message here, I think, is that humanities education cuts really deeply into an engagement with the real world, which is why humanities degrees are so important and the lifeblood, I think, of our universities and our culture. And, of course, humanities degrees are increasingly under attack. And when I think back to Ian Watt and I think back to the origins of UEA, every time someone crops up and questions the value of the humanities on the grounds that the humanities don't relate enough to the real world, my response is, how real can you handle? The humanities go right down to where the edge of humanity, where those pressing questions are first addressed. And that's always been um, my interest. As Tony said, I'm, I'm a specialist in the literature of the 20th century and in, increasingly in the legal history of the 20th century. And it was in the middle of the 20th century, after the war, after some of the experiences that um, Ian and others went through, that we had that first strong articulation of human rights. And in my, um, the book I published a couple of years ago, Judicial Imagination, that's what I was tracing. In the new book, I go back to the same period to look at um, 
how human rights responded to the refugee crises of the 30s and 40s. Um, right back down to um, the kind of, you know, the formation of different ways of imagining how we manage to be together in the world. And I think the first thing to say is when you think about refugees in terms of human rights and international law, you've, you're thinking about a tension between two things. On the one hand, you've got a human problem. Refugees find themselves in a kind of similar, often in a similar zone of inhumanity as Ian Watt and his um, um, compatriots did. I mean, obviously not on the level of cruelty and violence, but the kind of bureaucratized violence, the cruelty of admin, uh, administration, what Hannah Arendt famously called the banality of evil, um, is often plays a part on that. So you have a human problem, you have human suffering, you have human um, desperation, and you have people who are um, um, completely um, without protection. But on the other hand, because I know there are a lot of SOC people here as well and political scientists, you also have a political problem. Um, that is, you know, human rights, if you go back to the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, two things are affirmed, and these two things are always in tension. One is universal rights for everybody. Everyone should have a universal right. Two, um, communities and nation states should have the right to self-determination. So, you know, countries need to be able to exclude as well as include. And those two principles are at the core of all international human rights law, and they're always in tension. And they're particularly in tension when it comes to refugees and um, to migrants as well. That tension first appeared in the 30s and 40s, which is, the, as I said, the birth of human rights law. But it's a tension we're really re-experiencing in the West now. And I say in the West because in the global South, um, where population, mass, mass population movements have been a constant feature of the world ever since 1948, um, the idea that there's a refugee crisis um, is what they're basically saying. There's only a crisis because it's come back to the North and to the West. We've been dealing with this crisis um, for 70 years. Now, when I was working on the new book, Placeless People, um, I read a lot of responses to the refugee crisis of the mid-20th century. Literary texts, legal texts, extraordinary substantial records tracking refugee movements between 34 and 38. There's one of my favourite books. Um, you know, I'm, you said what a drive dust scholar I could be. One of my favourite books is, is this sort of thousand-page <laughs> book which tracks refugee movements from 1938. It's called The Refugee Survey. It's by a guy called Hope Simpson. And he managed, he had all these kind of different um, researchers in many, many different countries tracking um, the movement of refugees, particularly actually between 37 and 38. It's an extraordinary piece of work. And when you're trying to do similar work now to track refugee movements now, it's really, really difficult. It's really difficult to get hold of the data. So my hats go off to these amazing um, civil servants and scholars and activists and, and people working for non-governmental organizations. But the more I read of all this stuff and the polemics and people have the same arguments we're having now about you know, refugees and wages and rights and belonging, um, the more I became convinced that we've actually totally missed an important lesson from that period. And we failed to understand a lesson which a lot of people in that period understood very well indeed which is to say that refugees are not just an unfortunate humanitarian tragedy that happens to other people, but that statelessness or placelessness is a very radical form of rightlessness that cuts right to the heart of what we think of about citizenship, human rights, or how we share the planet with one another. Now, that very radical and very deep-seated um, rightlessness was very clear to people in the 30s and 40s, as I'm going to try and show. But somehow we've missed this point in the intervening years. We've kind of forgotten it. We've turned um, the question of refugees into a humanitarian issue when all along it was a question of rights. Now, in some ways, um, this was a, a misstep, uh, what, what the legal scholars call a misstep in the history of human rights. Um, I'll just let you answer that. <laughs> um, when um, the two giants of mid-20th century human rights 
were a guy called Hirsch Lauterpark, who was Jewish, who had come to Britain. And he was really the architect of many human rights laws, and he was certainly the kind of intellectual brain behind um, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Um, he, he came from um, Lov and uh, Lemberg in Poland. All his family were, were wiped out, and he then went on to be a leading international lawyer. And those of you who know Cambridge will know the Lauterpark Centre, which is set up in Hirsch's name. And Reddy Cassin, who um, was a French um, jurist. And both of them said strenuously, as all these documents were being put together, if human rights are going to be genuine human rights, we have to have a right to asylum have to have the right to asylum, which we don't have. In none of the UN documents on rights is there a right to asylum. We have a right to seek asylum, but not to have it, which is, if you read all the background and the archive work on this, is very interesting. If you go for the first, the first sort of big human rights document was the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And there's a very telling moment um, when the delegates and lawyers were sitting down to sort through um, uh, and, and agree the terms. I mean, it's an extraordinary undertaking just after the war with people coming from all different traditions, religious, all different political persuasions, but they actually got this thing together. And at one moment, they broke, down, broke off the proceedings to listen to um, a report from the UN guy who was currently trying to deal with um, the aftermath of the declaration of the State of Israel in, 19, in 1948 in Israel, Palestine. He was a really interesting guy called Ralph Bunch. Um, who was the first um, African-American to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and Ralph Bunch came in and basically said, well, what are you guys doing talking about all these abstract human rights? There's an absolute tragedy going on here. You know, you really need to address the issue of refugees. And so they did, but they addressed it in kind of the wrong way. <laughs> so what happened is people had a real debate about who should take refugees, under what terms should they take refugees. And what we ended up with was rather than a right to have asylum was the right to seek and enjoy asylum. And the politics um, students won't be too surprised to learn that the people who really pushed that amendment, who kind of quibbled about the right to asylum, were one Mrs. Corbett from the United Kingdom and the Saudi, Arabi, the Saudi Arabian delegates um, who were trying to push back for different reasons against this. So in the same year, 48, Lauter Park publicly condemned um, the Human Rights Declaration. He said, you know, we missed a chance here. What, what he really wanted, he had this great phrase. He said, the ambition of human rights was to turn refugees and other vulnerable people from objects of international compassion, which is the humanitarian narrative, into subjects of international rights. And he thought that basically we'd missed the opportunity to do that, to turn everyone into, you know, at least um, technically being the subject of international rights. Now, fast forward to today, and Lauterpark's ambition looks wildly ambitious. I mean, I know there are some refugee activists in the room, and I know some of you um, work with human rights law. I know, you know a couple of students who've gone in, into human rights law, and they will tell you, um, in the current context, it's been rather difficult to even persuade people to take refugees as objects of compassion let alone subjects of rights. I mean, we've actually really gone um, backwards from those moments just after the war. So we've missed something, I think. We've missed something about the crisis, the refugee crisis that we had in the 30s and 40s, um, which I think is worth looking at again. And to do that, I want to sort of shift a bit. I'm going to talk about three refugee writers. I am going to talk about literature as well because of the point I made earlier about, um, you know, we really need to understand the meaning of being human by looking at literature um, as well as history. So I'm going to talk about three refugee writers from the 1940s. All three at some point were refugees themselves. All three were passionately committed to justice and to living in the world with other people. They're all quite difficult and complicated writers, but they're not lofty. And all three, and this is where I think we need to pay attention, were very skeptical about human rights in the 1940s. They were quite suspicious about what kind of work human rights could do. So, and this is going to be my real argument, I think, this evening, that we, in, when, in, in terms of human rights history, we missed the opportunity to really make good protection for placeless people. And as a result of failing to heed that lesson, 
we or and also a lot of millions of refugees are living with the consequences of that. Okay, so my three are, this is my first, this is Hannah Arendt, the political philosopher um, and refugee, Jewish refugee. Um, Arendt, her story of how she became a refugee is um, really amazing. She slipped across the German and Czech border in the spring of 1933 through a safe house which had its front door in Germany and its back door in Czechoslovakia. Okay. So what you'd do if you were a fleeing German Jew or intellectual or political dissident, you'd arrive for dinner um, and then you'd depart stateless. So before dinner, you'd be a national citizen and after coffee, there you were, you were a refugee, you didn't have your citizenship anymore. You were at the mercy of whatever country would take you. Now, this all sounds like a Kafka story. Um, I'll talk a bit about this in a minute. You'll not be surprised to learn that one of the first things that Arendt did when she finally arrived in New York and to some kind of safety, was to write about Kafka, write about Franz Kafka. And she was actually editing his diaries. But to, before she got to New York, she lived in Paris with the refugee communities there. Before she was deported at the beginning of the war by the French um, as an enemy alien to Gurs detention camp, which is in southwest France. And while she was in the camp, again, like um, the Ian Watt story, they started up a kind of reading group um, they taught each other, but Arendt um, um, very carefully read um, Clausewitz's classic on war, which is this great text about the meaning of modern war. But she also, in something I identify with totally, manically read, reread all of George Simenon's detective stories, because um, she and really read loads and loads of detective fiction. Because she later said she thought, I thought it was a good idea to find out how policemen thought. Which, um, so, and the picture I have there's um, her stateless certificate. In Gurr's camp, there were a lot of um, artists and writers. This was an early camp. And this drawing, I don't know if this is Hannah Arendt, okay? So just say this for the camera. I don't know this is Hannah Arendt. Um, but this is a, um, lo there are loads of beautiful pictures by Lily Andrew, who was a painter in Gurr's camp. And if you go on the website of the um, United States Holocaust Museum, you can see these. And in loads of these pictures, um, there's a, a picture of someone, a woman reading. Um, from the camp um, and it's a bit like where's Wally because sometimes loads of loads of other things could be happening in these pictures and you'll see this woman reading and who I've convinced myself is um, Hannah Arendt. I was really pleased I found out today that um, my publisher um, has got um, her, um, Lily's estate to agree that I can have that image on the cover of my book so I'm really thrilled, thrilled about that. So that's my first um, person. My second person you may or may not have heard of, she's um, um, another Jewish <laughs> refugee called Simone Weil. Um, and if people talk about Weil at all today, it is as a rather strange Christian mystic who starved herself to death when she was a refugee in England in 1943. She would only eat the same rations as the French. Um, and she also had TB and she was very frail. And in the end she died. She's actually bur buried in Ashford, Kent. There was a very nice piece by the amazing poet and musician Patti Smith, who's very fond of Simone Vale, who made a pilgrimage to visit Simone's um, grave. Now, Simone Vale was born to a non-practicing Jewish family in Paris, and she was a philosopher. She was in well, the best of her year. I mean, the only person who outrivaled her was Simone de Beauvoir, so she's, you know, she's a smart woman. Um, but she cut her political teeth by working in a Renault factory in Paris and attempting but failing to join the Spanish Civil War. Now, she's in my story because she really understood how um, modern rootlessness, the causes and the consequences of modern rootlessness, like few others at the time or indeed since. She was also one of the first um, writers and philosophers to directly, very directly, criticize human rights. So when the war broke out, um, Vale left Paris with her family after France fell, and like many refugees, including Hannah Arendt, ended up in Marseille, um, where she stayed waiting to get hold of her exit papers. And that's where she is um, with a, another mystic, Lanza de, um, de Vasto, in Marseille in the summer sunshine. And she also spent her time there hanging out with Indian and Chinese laborers who'd been invited by France earlier in the 30s, because there was a big labor shortage in Paris, to work. And now, 
and now we're kind of surplus to requirement and basically told to go away and we're desperate to get out and she really identified and helped these guys and stayed stayed with these guys who were staying in a um, half-built prison she finally escaped and went to New York via Casablanca um, and there's a um, there's a there were lots of um, Jewish refugee camps in Casablanca which is a story the film doesn't quite tell um, but there's a camp called Ain Sabah refugee camp which was actually in the grounds of an old hotel and there weren't many chairs in this camp. So you had to kind of like get up in the morning and find your chair. And there's this story of Simone um, writing some of her most, you know, really passionate, intense work on this chair in the sun in Casablanca. And apparently she'd make her parents, who were very, very doting, sit on the chair when she couldn't be there so that she'd keep her chair so she could write. And from New York then she came to the UK and she worked for the Free French. Um, she drove de Gaulle mad, she was always pestering him. She thought, he thought she was completely mad. Um, but she did help rewrite the 1789 Declaration of Rights for the new post-war French um, Bill of Rights. And she wrote this amazing book with an introduction by T.S. Eliot who loved it called The Need for Roots. So my third um, character is a real writer. And as it was pointed out to me and I gave an earlier version of this lecture not a woman. Um, I think Samuel Beckett probably was slightly, maybe a woman, but we haven't found that out yet because he's so wonderful. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is the next big research break I'm hoping to make. Now Beckett, who, as you probably know, he, he, he moved from Ireland to Paris, but he was on the same refugee rat runs of occupied and Vichy France as Arendt and Simone Vale. With thousands and thousands of Parisians, he joined the very famous exodus in June 1940 down south. And if you think of some of those really surreal images um, from Beckett's writing, uh, people balancing their furniture on bicycles, and loads of bicycles, or boots just left under the trees, you know, and you, there's just these odd images. You can see that actually a lot of this was just picked up on the roadside from that flight. This is what it was in, in his imagination. He made it as far as Cahors in southwest France, which is actually just up, up the road from Montauban which is where Arendt, when, when, the, when France was occupied, Arendt and quite a few, about 30 women, escaped from Gurs camp and went to Montauban, which was a city, a town of refuge. Um, those who stayed in the camp because they were waiting, they, they thought their husbands and their families wouldn't be able to find them, most of them were deported to Auschwitz. So had Arendt stayed, um, there'd be no origins of totalitarianism, nothing. Most of those women were murdered. Arendt escaped to Montauban, which is literally up the road, um, from where um, um, Beckett was. He waited in Cahors, trying to get out, like Didi and Gogo later do in Waiting for Godot, planning a trip across the Pyrenees. That's what people wanted to do. And those of you who remember Waiting for Godot, remember there's this great scene between Gogo and Didi, and Gogo turns around, he says, we've got, we've got no rights anymore. And Didi turns around, and he said, you'd make me laugh if it wasn't prohibited. And that's just that kind of moment um, being captured there. Beckett didn't get an exit visa. He later said that he cried for the last time in his life in Cahors with the desperation of trying to get out and not being able to know. Um, and I've been working um, and with writers, Syrian writers and refugees in Beirut recently, and that kind of sense of you might, you don't know whether you're going to get out. You don't know where to go, um, and you know if you have to stay, the likelihood um, of your family being in immediate danger is one that Beckett, Arendt, and Vale all experienced. In the end, he went back to Paris, where he worked for the resistance before heading south again to um, wait out the war in um, Roussillon, which is in um, Provence. Now, Beckett, of course, is one of the best writers about homelessness and the placeless condition we've got. But I've put him in this talk because, again, like many at the time, he was very skeptical. He recognized that a new kind of human misery had opened up in the world. Um, but he didn't really think that the new humanitarianism or human rights would be able to fix this new problem. He's also in this lecture because he was a humanitarian volunteer. Um, just after the war, Beckett volunteered for the Irish Red Cross in saint Lo in Normandy. Norm um, saint Lo was absolutely decimated um, by American bombing, uh, making him one of the very first um, kind of critical intellectual um, humanitarian. And you can see him, he's third along with his glasses um, from the right there in Saint Lo with other members of the Irish Red Cross. Um, he, I mean, he got the job because his French was very, very good. 
um, and he was a good man. And actually, on the other side there, you've got the short stories he wrote. It's a manuscript of the short stories that Beckett wrote um, just after the war and just after he had had this experience of working with um, placeless people um, in saint Lo. And I'm showing you this for a couple of reasons. One, you can see Beckett's doodles, which I just think are beautiful and amazing. Um, you can really get a sense of him trying to articulate something new in the world. The other reason is the Beckett estate charges an extraordinary amount of money to reproduce Beckett anywhere in any form, which I've paid, so I now show this everywhere, um, <laughs> willingly. I'm going to get a T-shirt with Samuel Beckett's manuscripts written on it, because um, me and my publisher have certainly paid for it. Now, just here, John Gregory, who's a wonderfully talented young historian in the Department of History at UEA, when I was talking about this lecture, he said, you need a map. <laughs> So I said, yes, I need a map, John. Um, so he very kindly made me a map of where all these people have been. So if you, um, if you want to go around, you can, you can tell um, my children dread it when we go to the south of France because I take, do take them around former detention camps and refugee routes and make them walk over the Pyrenees and do the refugee run. And it's a, can't we go to Disneyland? No, we're going to go as detention camp. Um, but you can see the route. So the red one is Hannah Arendt. She goes, girls, Montauban, Marseille. And then she goes to Popo, which is on the border. And then she goes to New York. You can see Simone Veil, um, Par uh, who Paris, Marseille. She went to Casablanca, then she went to New York, and then she went to the UK. Beckett is the one, because he's not Jewish, who could come and go eventually. Okay? So Beckett um, went down to Rousseau, went back to Paris. Um, he went back to Dublin, and then he came to saint Lo, and then he went back to Paris. Now, um, the map is quite helpful because it helps um, make establish a connection that Hannah Arendt first um, spotted between being placeless or stateless and genocide. And um, you know, she was the first spot there was a connection between being making someone stateless when, you're, when you have no legal or political citizenship and genocide i.e. the final and complete eradication of a person or their group from the face of the earth. So there is a connection, she says, between once you've rendered... Remember, the first thing that happened in the Nuremberg Laws to the Jewish people was that they were made... They were de-citizenized. They were stripped of their German citizenship. And that set the tone and set the conditions, the legal conditions, um, to turn them, as Arendt put it, um, to put them into the factories that made human corpses. Eric Hobsbawm, the late great Eric Hobsbawm, made the same point in his wonderful book, The Age of Extremes. He said the 20th century was so extreme, we started doing such appalling things to each other, we had to invent new names to describe what we were doing. And the new names were genocide and statelessness. Okay, so to get to the point where strangers, refugees, stateless people um, could become in danger of genocide. We only have to watch what's happening in several places of the world now to see that that, that that holds that theory. The meaning of exile had to change. The meaning of being strange or being a stranger had to change. Or as Arendt wrote um, in 1944 in a, um, um, a little essay called Guests from No Man's Land, everywhere she said the word exile, which once had an undertone of sacred awe, now provokes the idea of something suspicious and unfortunate. So in earlier moments of history, travelers and exiles were greeted with um, hospitality. I've been reading Emily Watson's, if you haven't, do read it, her fantastic translation of the Odyssey, first woman to translate the Odyssey. Um, and I hadn't read the Odyssey um, since I was an undergraduate. Um, and what really is clear about the Odyssey is it's, it's a book about strangers and hospitality. It spends ages talking about, you know, when Odysseus rocks up saying, hi, I'm a stranger, where's my presents? Where's my, my dancing girls and my wine? <laughs> um, and so that, that, that kind of, you know, that Homeric tradition of the stranger being someone who's on a voyage of self-discovery, but someone, because he's on that voyage of self-discovery, should be respected. That changed in modern times. Because I'm in a history department, I'm defining modern times from the 18th century upwards, right? not now, but um, m modernity. Um, now, the common explanation for this shift from why strangers um, became people who were suspicious and unfortunate is the expansion of nationalism and the nation state and the idea of national belonging. 
So what you had in the 18th century was the development of the nation state and the development of ideas about nationalism, which by the 1940s, someone like Arendt would say, had got totally out of control. Okay? Um, so as sociologist Richard Sennett put it, he's put this beautiful essay called The Foreigner, which has recently been reissued. He says, modern nationalism made those who leave their nations seem like surgical patients who'd suffered an amputation. In other words, under the system of the modern nation state, who you were was really connected to where you were. So that to be a person without a nation was to be a person in pain and unfortunate. Listen to example to the Jewish Austrian writer Stefan Zweig, um, writing in his refugee memoir. He left um, Austria in 1934, The World of Yesterday. Zweig says, I have not felt that I entirely belong to myself anymore, he wrote. Something of my natural identity has been destroyed forever with my original, real self. Zweig came to the UK um, when the UK also started to um, round up um, enemy aliens at the beginning of the war. Um, he went to Brazil where he committed suicide in 1942. Now, in Origins of Totalitarianism, which is her really big book, which some of you um, will have read as, as students, some of you might have reread recently because it's been um, going since Trump was elected, suddenly the Origins of Totalitarianism is now on the bestseller um, lists again. Um, and she made um, a really important argument about how those changed meanings of exile in the 20th century produced this radical new form of rightlessness, which I'm trying to talk about here. And she said that by the early 20th century, you had this really lethal combination between nationalism, the rise of bureaucracy and law and administration. Remember, passports are really, really recent inventions. The ways that people became paper, where we started to administer um, lives through administration. Combination of that and economic catastrophe um, in the beginning of the 20th century and racism and colonialism and anti-Semitism meant that it was game over for that big 18th century European and American dream of um, the rights of man, the rights of man which founded really the idea of the European nation state. What she said, um, the 1940s revealed, that was really that rights were only as good as the nation state you happened to live in, which if your state was racist or nationalist, meant you didn't have any rights at all. So she has this kind of typically kind of um, twisty quote, which a lot of um, political scientists are fond and philosophers quote. She says there's a paradox with human rights. We talk about human rights, but paradoxically, when you're only human, when you don't have legal protection, when you don't have political representation, when you're not in a state, when all you are is human, you have no rights at all. So to be only human is to be in the most vulnerable place on earth. So that, that was what she said. And the stateless and the refugees, she said, like colonial subjects before them, were the people who feel this total absence of rights most keenly. And, she said, they represent it to others. And this is why refugees are greeted with suspicion as well as pity. They reveal to us how vulnerable everybody's citizenship is. That's Orwell made a very similar point, actually, um, just after the war. This is, what the, this is the message that refugees bring, bring us. It could be you. It's just an accident of where you were born that gives you these national, legal, um, juridical, and political rights. Well, now when she, she talks about Kafka, she said, this is, this is what Kafka was trying to tell us. Um, this is, you know... Um, this is the story he was telling in the castle. Actually, there's a really early essay by Max Seibolt, who might have taught some of you who are EUR, which makes a very similar point. In the castle, um, and in, if you've read the novel, and if you don't, and you're interested in refugee issues, I really recommend reading the castle. Anthea Bell, who was also Max Seibolt's translator, has got a new translation out, and it's brilliant. And she said, in the novel, Carr is a stranger, K. Carr is a stranger, and he turns up at the village at the castle because he thinks he's been invited to work, and that's his first mistake. And he soon finds himself being made really unwelcome, but he can't work out why. Um, so this is kind of, you know, a hostile environment. It's like, you know, Theresa May might have read Kafka and thought, yeah, we're going to do this. This, is, this looks good. 
So the landlady at one point who kicks him out of his hotel, she turns around to him and says, you're not from the castle, you're not from the village, you are nothing, she shouts. And then she adds, you are one thing though, a stranger, one who is superfluous and gets in the way everywhere and is a constant source of trouble. It's the landlady who's read the 19, no, 2014 Immigration Act and is well aware of her responsibilities. Now, the castle, and Rent's reading this in 1944, and she's only in her 30s. Okay, so she's reading this in 1944, and she says it's got two lessons that are really valuable. And there are two lessons that I think will be, again, familiar to some of us today. The first is that laws intended to exclude, and all sovereign states and nation states have to have laws that, laws that exclude, are at their most psychologically and culturally effective when they're insanely capricious and make no sense. Then they really work. They don't actually work, as has been demonstrated recently. A number of um, people who've been um, deported by, as illegal immigrants since the beginning of the, um, since the 2014 Immigration Act has stayed the same and actually gone down. It doesn't work, okay? Psychologically and culturally, these insane rules work very well. The second lesson is that it's really easy for people to miss the politics of this and start telling sad and sentimental stories about people's suffering. And one of the reasons that Carr can't penetrate through to the castle to get his rights is because of this strange, eerie paralysis that's set around in the village. People can't see it, so everyone's sitting there going, oh, it's a shame, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> and again, this sounds familiar. You know, nothing stops us, this sort of mist and murk. Now, at this point, you think, well, what we need is more human rights. This is clearly awful. Let's have more human rights. But Arendt was very sceptical. She didn't think that the UN Declaration would make the world any less Kafkaesque. But this wasn't because she didn't believe in rights. She, she actually did. But in the big argument that between whether rights should be philosophical or political, she'd always come down on the side of politics. Very few refugees, she said in 1949, were asking for human rights. They didn't ask for that. They asked for a place they could belong, somewhere they could go. That's what they asked for. So if we follow a rent, um, refugees aren't just objects or pity or um, the reminders of our own insecurity. They're strangers from somewhere else who remind us how man-made rights are. And that's a good thing and a bad thing, because if they're man-made, they can go really wrong. But if we're the ones who are making them, we can make them better. So that's her message. Now, Arendt really loved Kafka because... Um, because of this. <laughs> okay. Um, if we could just, if, yeah, if you could just wave to me once the slides are... Ah, there we are. Here's her end. <laughs> this is me talking about capricious systems. This is clearly Kafka's ghost. Simone Weil. Um, now, I read love Kafka because he really identified as a pariah. He knew he was one of the closest people. Kafka was Jewish. He knew he was suspicious and unfortunate. And this is a position that Simone Weil um, also took up. If any of you have read her writing will know, and this is the reason why Patti Smith and a lot of poets really like her work, it's very otherworldly. It's quite difficult um, to get hold of, and it's, it's usually the poets who are most drawn to her work. Um, like Arendt, though, um, Vale thought that refugees had a perspective that no one else had. They had a unique perspective on the modern world. Um, and she makes this point, and if I only say this about Simone Weil, this will be my message to you. She wrote this amazing essay on the Iliad in 1941. Um, and she had to publish it under a pseudonym because the Vichy law says she, because she was Jewish, she couldn't publish, right? So she published it under a pseudonym. And in um, this amazing essay on the Iliad, she speculates that those of you who remember the Iliad or those of you who've read the poem, well, no, it's a very neutral poem. You can't tell who the poet wants to win, whether it's Achilles or Hector. They both get ill, you know, equal weighting. It, it's a war poem. It's about the tragedy of war. It's not a nationalist poem. And that's why it's so unrelenting. You remember the Iliad, I mean, it's endless corpses. I mean, it's just corpses after corpses after corpses. And she says it's got that neutral tone um, because she speculates, and there's, no, there's very little evidence for this, it was written by later generations of refugees from the Trojan Wars, who were able to see the war, wars from a different perspective. So 
What that led her to do is to put the idea of placelessness at the centre of her thought, which is kind of what I'm suggesting we need to do today. But she made another point. She said placelessness didn't just affect refugees. She said uprootedness was the tragic condition of our own times for everybody, not only the refugees and dispossessed, but all who capitalism and colonialism had torn from their roots. So she, she identified there was a really strong need for people to belong to places, to have roots. So that's her lesson to us also, alongside Hannah Arendt. She's saying, you know, refugees aren't just the product of circumstance. Displacement in nations and across them is structural to the way that capitalism and colonialism uproot people from their homes. And a bit like Hannah Arendt, although she's even more forceful. I mean, she's sitting there in 1943, just before she's dying, thinking, I think human rights are going to be a real waste of time. Then you think, sweetie, you're, you're a Jewish refugee, you're about to die, most of the people are dying. How can you think human rights is a waste of time? What are you talking about? But she says, actually, no rights have always been to do with war and appropriation. Rights started, if you go back to John Locke, you go back to colonialism, rights started as property rights. And then they were political rights, and then they were civil rights. And she didn't think calling them human rights was going to get us out of that kind of politics where we're constantly trying to trade one set of rights against another, and then we start to fight for who has the right to whatever. And she said, you think we're going to call this human? You think that's going to get rid of it? Think, think again. And again, if you think of the rights, the wars we've had in the 21st century that have often been made in the name of human rights, the wars in Iraq, the wars in, in Libya, she might have a point. If you're going to intervene for, to make a humanitarian war in the name of humanity, are those wars any less bloody than the wars we had over territory or property? And the answer has to be, no, they weren't. So then the question is, what do we think we're doing with human rights? So this lecture's taken on an old point, and I'm, I'm going to get to Samuel Beckett, then you know that you can have another, another a pair of spritz or white wine. Um, and I've been it's taken a rather odd course. Like, I've been arguing that we've marginalized the importance of placelessness and rightlessness and refugees, and that we've missed one of the big lessons from the 20th century. And one of the reasons um, that we really need literature and history alongside law and policy, I work with a lot of social scientists now and a lot of lawyers, um, we need to have literature and history in that conversation so we can begin to see how profoundly uprootedness and refugeedom has shaped our times. That's a very UAA thing to say, actually. That's still back to that original do different vision of interdisciplinarity and conversation. But on the other hand, I've been arguing that rather than urging more humanitarianism, more human rights, which is usually what we say in the humanities, you know, we're the human people, do more human things, it'll be better. I've been talking up the work of two women um, who were human rights skeptics. Simone Weil thought that human rights were too worldly, too, talk, too caught up in political economy, too caught up in power games to actually deliver justice. Hannah Arendt thought they weren't worldly enough, weren't strong enough. She couldn't see how you compel people to make people into international citizens of human rights. She predicted, and there's a um, bit in The Origins of Totalitarianism saying, if this carries on, you will have, I mean, she wouldn't be at all surprised by it today, there'll be people who live in what she calls the dark background of difference, millions of them, who have no um, judicial rights, no political rights, and who will be threatening because of that, because you can only hold people in that kind of conditions for so long. Both women, and I think this is why their skepticism is so valuable, wanted more than human rights, and that's the kind of lesson I take from them. They're both very, very committed to social and political justice. And I, I find it hard to think of two women thinkers more committed from this period. But they're both telling us that so far as placed as people are concerned, the justice proposed by human rights was only ever going to fail better, which is my cue for Samuel Beckett. Now, Samuel Beckett, perhaps not surprisingly, was even less impressed about the newfound enthusiasm for human rights in the 1940s than either Arendt or Vail. In 1946, UNESCO, which is the cultural and scientific wing of the United Nations, had a big festival of human rights and humanity where people gave lectures and um, you know, Sartre and Camus and um, others, and it was all this you know, newfound humanity. 
and some, including Beckett, just sort of sat there grumbling about this. Humanity, he grumbled in 1946, he said, humanity is about as welcome as a dum-dum bullet, i.e. people only start talking about humanity when they've done really nasty things to each other. Um, dum-dum bullets um, are expand when they hit human flesh, so they're customised to do that. And they were banned by the Hague Convention in 1899, one of the first kind of international human rightsy type of conventions, except for use on colonial subjects. So you weren't allowed to use them on Europeans. You were allowed to use them on colonial subjects. That, that was all right. Um, last month, Médecins Sans Frontières were reporting unusually severe wounds in Gaza, which some have speculated and suggested, um, and the Israeli Defense Force does actually have form on this, are a customized form of dum-dum bullets. So those bullets have been moved. It's Palestinians, of course, who, um, whose history starts in the period I've been talking about, are, it hardly needs saying this week, are modern history's longest suffering group of stateless people, and perhaps the best qualified to talk about placelessness as an ongoing atrocity. Now, what Beckett, when he's been grumpy, disliked was not people, far from it. What he disliked was hypocrisy. What he disliked was faux humanitarianism or a kind of phony um, humanism. When he worked with the Red Cross in Normandy, he wrote to a friend that he was really weary of what he called the patronizing Anglo-Saxon attitude of his co-workers towards the people they were helping. Um, and in a radio script he wrote at the same time, he argued what was needed was not charity or what he called the having and the not having and the giving and the taking and la-di-da-di-da, but a collective smile deriding, a collective smile of solidarity. Now, just after working for the Red Cross, Beckett wrote his first stories, and he wrote most of... He, he started writing in English, and then uh, that was the moment where he decided he was going to write in French. He decided to become a stranger in his own language. And those of you, I mean, I really like Beckett's French because my friend, I struggle with French as well. I really like the idea of this sort of stripped down French, um, this slightly strange French that he uses. It's very, very compelling to read. And he wrote those stories with which his mature work is now associated with. Those, those placeless people, those characters that we, we, we um, associate with Beckett tumbled into the world just after the war and just after he'd worked for the Red Cross. Those wanderers, those vagrants, Migrants, they're suspicious, they're piteous, they're funny, they're touching, they're obscene, they're tender, they're very, very chatty. They're Kafka's heirs, they're Beckett's placeless people. Now, I'm going to end with a quote from just one of these stories, The End, which is the first story he wrote after he'd worked for the Red Cross. And Beckett's narrator begins this story by when he's being expelled from a charitable institution. And the rest of the story is basically what happens to him after he's being expelled from the hospital, where he's basically chucked out of wherever he goes. He's going through all these different thresholds, and he's, been, he's becoming that kind of Beckettian character. And as he's returned into this um, indifferent and hostile world, Beckett's narrator complaint is one that I think is currently being repeated by many refugees and asylum seekers um, today. I said, he said, is there a law that prevents you from throwing me out? naked and penniless? And the answer he gets might also sound very familiar. We're a charitable organization, says the official, and think how many institutions today proclaim their virtue by saying, well, we're really nice, we're fair, we're a charitable institution, before saying in exactly the same breath, never come back here. <laughs> Whatever you do, you're not going to be let in, go away. You know, so so, so that, kind of, that kind of cynical humanitarianism um, you get, we are being fair. We are being just. We're doing what we can. Go away. And actually, there is indeed a law which prevents us from doing this, um, with one of Beckett's favourite French words in it. And it's called Article 33, and it's from the 1951 Refugee Convention, which says very, very clearly, and I think when the law writes like this, it's as good as any poem, that no state shall expel or return, in the French road, road is a refouleur, a refugee back to where their life might be threatened or in danger. Now, some refugee lawyers today will argue that Article 33 on non refoulement is pretty much all we have left of that great ambition to make everyone the subject of international law, i.e. it's all that protects refugees from becoming, as Kafka's landlady put it, nobody's nothings. There's still no right to asylum in international law, only the right to seek asylum. 
And recently, what's happened in Europe, European countries, the EU, have got round our obligations not to expel or return people by exporting our immigration control either to non-state agencies, Frontex, or to countries like Libya that are not signed up to the 1951 Refugee Convention. So we've kind of exported that work so we can keep, we can keep saying, we're a charitable organization, <laughs> go away. And we can do that because we've exported our responsibilities elsewhere. So effectively what we have um, 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 in Europe at the moment is pretty much a hodgepodge system of um, what the lawyers call non entree. Now, from what I'm arguing this afternoon, I'm going to conclude by saying in order for a refugee and human rights to work, we need a more robust politics that makes laws like Article 33 more effective. This, I think, is what Simone Weil and Hannah Arendt were telling us. And I think this is what they'd be urging us to do, to take back control of return of human rights and return them to the politics of citizenship, which we, as citizens, decide who comes in, who comes out, under what terms. Today, we have very good examples, both writers and lawyers, doing their best to answer Beckett's character's complaint and to make that law work. I'm thinking, for example, there's a, the work of a group of very young lawyers called Global Legal Action Network, and they're currently bringing a case using Article 33 against Italy over its coordination with the Libyan Coast Guard, um, who have been pulling back um, migrants and refugees into Libya. And they're using Article 33 to do that. I don't think it's going to work. Uh, no, don't scrap that. I think it is going to work, guys. Go for it. <laughs> um, it's, it's complicated, but it's, it's a very good um, effort. But I've also been saying, and I think this comes back to my point, I hope I've been making well um, throughout this evening, about the importance of the humanities. We really need a wider and deeper cultural, ethical, and political understanding of the ways in which placelessness is not simply other people's tragedy, but one of the atrocities of our times that we're yet to catch up with. So deep from with the darkness of their own times, Hannah Arendt, Simone Weil, and Samuel Beckett all thought that a world that could not even grant its inhabitants the right to exist was seriously intolerable. I think it's still intolerable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, there's time for some questions, ladies and gentlemen. If anyone would like to, to start uh, with, put, uh, raise your hands. There are roving mics in the room. So. Those of you who I've taught will know I can point to people. <laughs> I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see you now. Yes. Thanks very much, just to Lindsay. And um, so you, had that, you started with that quote from Hannah Arendt about the exile being almost romanticized hmm. in the past. Um, I wondered then what you think of the works of exiles like Dante's Divine Comedy and the works on exiles like the old English poems like The Wanderer and The Seafarer. Hmm. That's a lovely question. Thank you. I think Dante, of course, is the, with the Odyssey, the exile text of the 20th century, of, of, human, of Western human history. Um, one of my favorite, not favorite, but I, want, I think in terms of what I've been talking about, what happens to that tradition of exile, I don't think we ever lose touch with the ability of the poets to tell us stories about how to survive exile. I think that's really, really important. Um, but those conditions have changed. And as you were talking, I was thinking of um, a totally brilliant scene from Primo, Primo Levi's If That Is A Man, um, which, as some of you will know, is his um, testimonial account of his time in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And Levy is describing um, working slave laboring and in this particular scene, there was um, this young guy called the Piccolo, and the Piccolo, who was French, he's like a guy called Jean, who actually Levy later met. 
And his job was to go and fetch the soup for the guys who were labouring for lunchtime. And if you were really lucky, you got to go with Piccolo, Piccolo to carry the soup back to the workers. And in this um, um, chapter called The Canto of Ulysses, um, Levy describes crossing the camp with um, Jean um, desperately. You know, he's Italian, trying to translate as much of Dante to Jean as possible. And the whole chapter is about you know, the, the necessity to try and translate, because he's doing it in French, and, but it's Italian, but it's vernacular Italian. Um, and at some point in that, he says, it's not that you know, we're going to translate Dante's <laughs> in the middle of Auschwitz and communicate the meaning of the poem. It's the effort to communicate itself through poetry that is, make, is, is keeping us as men. And at one point he says how good Jean, how good the piccolo was, he saw how important it was for me to communicate. And it's that poem, that's why your question is so good, um, that is being, um, as it were, resurrected at that moment in the most inhuman place on earth. Um, they're citing Dante. So I think, and also, I mean, it's, you know, of the work I've done with um, refugee writers, young, young men in Sicily, with Marina Warner, we use um, things like Gilgamesh, we use old stories, legends, for people to tell their refugee tales today. But they're different tales. But the stories is there, which is kind of what I meant by saying why we need to have the arts and humanities at the center of this conversation. Another question? Yep. Um, thanks for a really fascinating talk. Um, I just wonder if you might say something about how these writers could, um, or maybe they don't, but what do they tell us about the relationship between statelessness as a nation state and the sort of broader notions of, of citizenship within other structures like the European Union yeah. and the tension perhaps between that and the nation state or the states in America and the idea of the United States yeah. as a nation. Yeah, that's, that's a really um, great question and one that it troubles me in the book and a lot of the book is being troubled by that. I think um, for a lot of these writers and all well as well who I write about, we're trying to, by the end of the war, think how, how can we have a political community of like-minded citizens without nationalism? What would that look like? Um, Hannah Arendt thought that too, and which is why, even though when she, when she left Germany, she had to leave because she was arrested working for a Zionist organization. Um, but in um, 1945, when... Um, 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 the, the Zionist movement said they wanted Israel to be a nation state on the model of the national European state, she was absolutely devastated, absolutely devastated. She said, you've missed the opportunity, you've turned it in to a nationalist state. You do that and you'll be at the mercy of your Western allies and threatened from Arab countries until the end. And wasn't she right? Okay. Um, and she said, you've missed the opportunity to imagine a kind of citizenship within a different narrative of what belonging might mean. And I don't think we've, I mean, I think, you know, what's happened in the last uh, three years, I don't think we're there yet. I think we've gone back on imagining forms of citizenship. But I, think, I kind of think that. And then I look at, you know, the work. If you look at somewhere like Badawi Refugee Camp, which is a Palestinian camp on the northern border of Lebanon, where I've done some work. Um, and Badawi um, has been taking a lot of Syrian refugees in for very complicated reasons. Um, and is kind of an in legal limbo. You, you don't, don't, people don't have a Lebanese citizenship, don't have Palestinian citizenship, but they're making a political community work under the most impossible of circumstances, really impossible of circumstances. So it is possible to have versions of citizenship that arise in response, but we've been so slow to imagine what that might mean. At the same time, I don't believe that you, know, you can have a world citizenship. I, I gave a version of this talk with Philippe Sanz, the international lawyer, earlier this week. And Philippe um, says, you know, what we need is a world, an national, international passport world citizenship. And I don't think that's going to work either. Um, there, it was proposed, actually, during the 1951 convention, Penn and a group of writers wrote for evidence to the International Refugee Organization, which was the forerunner 
of the um, UNHCR saying what you need is world citizenships and world passports and who needs the country? We don't. Everyone should be cosmopolitan citizenship. And, and this guy from the International Refugee Organization, Bertie Turnstein, goes, are you mad? <laughs> These people need a nation state. You know, you need, we need nation states because that's what gives us... We, don't, we need states to give us representation and organization. That's what, that's what Rent meant by the right to have rights. So before we talk about human rights... Um, or the rights to property, or the rights to housing, right, health rights, women's rights, etc. You have to have the right um, to be heard and have political representation in a community. That's the first right, because without that, you don't have anything else. And I think we're still, that's the question of today. We're still puzzling over that, and I think we've gone backwards on um, our political and moral imagination. And so who knows what that citizenship might look like, although there are several great examples of what it can look like. I mean, if you look at kind of um, refugee activism um, in this country and in America, the people who are doing a lot to help refugees, um, often at personal risk, um, are churches and mosques. And so different kind of understandings of what it means to be in a community which um, obeys certain moral rules. So, you know, I mean, I have this vision that, you know, the real people smugglers in Britain at the moment are actually the WI. <laughs> because these people are absolutely, you know, you don't do this to children, you don't do this to people. Um, but they have a very strong sense of community, whether it's church, I mean, the mosques, um, in, certainly in Lebanon and certainly in Jordan, um, have a really, really important role to play. So, you know, we need to be um, um, open-minded. And I think we have been locked into a kind of, you know, secular nation-state European model of citizenship and it's really time we started to explore other forms of citizenship. Yeah. And they have to be able to go somewhere to seek work. Mm. Whether they can cross a dotted line or not yeah. is, 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 is an unnecessary inconvenience. Yeah. So, so we need the, 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 the framework of the debate needs to be changed. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, and, and I think that's why um, Simone Weil and others are very interesting. Because Hannah Arendt really did think it was a nation state problem. And we have got locked in that thinking. Um, whereas Vale's point was actually, you know, this you know, displacement is a problem about capitalism, economy, and it's a problem around colonialism. One. So, you know, you know think about other models. Or also think, I was talking to um, a scholar earlier in the week who's just publishing on Sharia law. There are different versions of belonging in the world, different versions of having a home. And we have got locked into a Eurocentric model which I think has um, you know, become completely paranoid at the moment. It's like we're trying to cling on to something that wasn't even there. I mean, the nation states really I mean, it hadn't been around for very long. And it can go again. <laughs> you know, we don't need it. I mean, we can have something else. I mean, we might not want feudalism. <laughs> but, you know, we can... Um, it, it's, as you said, it's not sacrosanct. Um, but there's those moments when people feel threatened and it becomes sacrosanct. So, that, I mean, certainly in terms of the humanities, I think that's why a lot of us are... Not so much tearing up the script, but really pushing hard for global humanities and arguing that undergraduates today just you know, don't need the kind of, you know, a, a kind of European focus version of history or literature. Um, but if we're really going to start having those conversations, we need to do global history and global literature. That's some of the things we've been doing as well. But you're absolutely right. Going back to the question before last, um, you're talking about Israel, and you were saying that it didn't work. They did originally intend for everybody to have equal rights, whatever the religion, etc. But it all went wrong, didn't it, in 1948? What would you have envisaged could have happened? What what could those um, Jewish refugees? have done, where could they have gone if not there? 
and what would you have liked to have happened? I mean, the British made a mess of it, as you know, and it's been a complete and utter disaster, mm. hasn't it? Mm. So can you give your <laughs> actual <laughs> suggestion of what hey, could Lindsay, have happened? can you solve the problem of Israel? Yeah, I was... <laughs> um, it is really complicated. Um, and I, but I do think the narrative that says Israel was the redeeming home for the refugees is part true and it's part mythology. Zionism was there before the refugees were there. So if you read, um, and I mean, take the famous case of the ex Exodus, the big the boat, the Orwell, actually Orwell's 1984, when Winston writes against totalitarianism for the first time in his diary, um, he writes about um, a ship of Jewish refugees being torpedoed in the Mediterranean. No one remembers this. Everyone remembers the rats. No one remembers the sinking ship. Right? Orwell was passionately against Zionism because he was passionately against um, um, nationalism, and he was also anti-Semitic. But he was reading his friend Arthur Kessler's work at the time, and Kessler was a Zionist, and Kessler was passionate about Palestine, and Kessler had worked in Palestine. And it was that same question. I think there was a moment where there was a very different version of Palestine imagined. And for a lot of political reasons, like the war, like um, the Arab states um, under, you know, underestimating um, the battle they'd have, um, the nationalism was racked up. And so it became something that a lot of people did not want to imagine. Um, so that, that, that did kind of happen. But also you get these stories of, you know, if, if you look at the Exodus, um, which some of you remember the Paul Newman movie <laughs> of the Exodus. And I remember the Exodus. My mother was the kind of mother who gave me two books when I was a teenager. One was Anne Frank. Soon after Anne Frank, I got to given Leonor Owens' Exodus. And this is quite clear the way you were supposed to go. <laughs> and then this. <laughs> so it's a very kind of nationalist narrative. But the real story is that actually refugees and survivors in Israel were not greeted as national heroes. Um, they were treated with pity and suspicion because they were not part of the national narrative. They were the, they were the ones who, one was suspicious because you were suspicious if you'd survived. So how did you survive? What did you do? And they were suspicious because um, they were victims and we treat victims very badly. Yeah, everyone does. Um, so it wasn't until the Eichmann trial that they got their moment. So the idea of um, you know um, refugees f flooding from the camps to throw themselves on the beach on Haifa beaches, where they're greeted, um, is is not quite what happened. So, but yet again, and this is the point I think Orwell makes: refugees are always in someone else's narrative, whether it was Ben Gurion's or the British, um, they were always in someone else's narrative. And also, what I really, what cuts me up about the Exodus um, narrative is those people who got on the boat, what happened is, the, you know, they set sail from Set in, in France, sailed. They were unarmed, and there was a lot of women, a lot of children. The British um, um, boarded the boat, um, and they didn't have any weapons. So these guys defended themselves with potatoes and cans and things like this. By the time the Exodus docked at Haifa, and there were photos from it, it was a wreck. I mean, it had been, it had been you know, shot to bits. And it, it wasn't armed, it was completely defenseless. The British shot it to bits. And then loaded the people on to another boat, sent them back. They were going to send them back to Hamburg. This is normal from what? They were going to send them back to the camps. This is after the war. Okay. So they, they go back to set and they bring up the little boats to take the people off and they just refuse to move. And they sit there for six weeks. Um, and there are some fishermen from set coming in, throwing them food. The only people who got off the boat were people who were dying um, or women about to give birth. Everyone else, including the children, stayed on that boat. And they had nowhere else to go. And finally, this is 48. This is the best, but what was going on with the political narrative, it gave Ben-Gurion the best propaganda victory he could ever have because the British just looked appalling. I mean, Ben-Gurion, and actually Kessler says in his memoir, I mean, what was Atlee thinking? I mean, this is just like, you know, talk about own goal. 
I mean, what was he doing? This is it's insane. And so the Exodus became part of the myth that my mother's generation um, and that kind of 60s generation um, you know, was very, very powerful. But before these people were Israelis, they were citizens of the sea. They were citizens of nowhere, Teresa. Um, and that's all they had. That's what a rent means about being human. I can't answer the question. <laughs> well, yeah, I can. I can always. I can always imagine it. Um, you know, there's this great scene from um, Muriel Sparks' book about Israel, Mandibar Gate, which is just brilliant. And there's a scene towards the end where she describes Jaffa, and which is a kind of hippie town when she went, and it's just full of sort of um, Arabs, Jews. You know, gay people, artists, dancers, some of them mad, some of them, but some of them would never be mad, some of them would never be um, um, defeated and would have been the flower, flower and beauty of the Middle East if only they could be allowed to be. And I think that there's still that kind of, you know, if you look at the kind of protests in Haifa today, you look at the kind of Israeli, Jewish, Palestinian joint um, political work, it's still, there's still possibility for a different type of citizenship. I hope. One more question, if there is one. Yeah. Yes. At one point, you said about how everything being administered, funnily enough, I'm an administrator, that's my job. Can you see a system without all of that? Partly because of technology, partly the way things are going. Everything has to be counted or mm. accountable. If there was a way of taking that away, could that help? Mm. As someone works in a modern university, I can't think of anything more wonderful than the idea of saying, hey, let's just not do it. Um, and, and in some ways, you know, that, that, that it's quite compelling. I mean, I think, I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? Because one of the reasons we started administering things was to make things fairer. You know, because when I say, oh, you know, let's go back to, you know, let's go back to how universities were, well, I wouldn't be there. <laughs> you know, it's a, a woman troublemaker, well, not really common room, you know. Uh, so we need, you know, we do need um, these systems. But I think as recent... Um, events have shown, particularly around social, you know, the kind of data. When Hannah Arendt talked about the banality of evil, when she was looking at Eichmann, I think she was wrong about Eichmann. I think, you know, I think he was evil, and I think she got him wrong. Um, but her, her more salient point, which is the way that administration and, and decision-making um, can happen through these systems, can produce outrageous, atrocious outcomes, is not wrong. Um, and if you look at you know, someone like Ronnie Brownman, who was one of the founders of Medicine Sans Frontier, Doctors Against Borders, who resigned from that position, even though he was a very forceful and effective humanitarian, he still is, um, because he was being forced into making administrative and bureaucratic decisions around population transfer. So how are we going to get that group of refugees to move? We'll cut down their rations. Hang on, I'm supposed to be the humanitarian here. What have I just done? You know. So it's this kind of sense of um, the kind of evil potential evil or cruelty that can be done through administrative systems. I mean, we've got this at the moment, you know, there are a lot of people in the Home Office who are really lovely people who are really trying to work hard. You know, and I don't agree with that bit of the left who just wants to say, well, they're all horrible, but they're not. The systems are like something out of Kafka, are producing consequences. I'm sure some of them are horrible, they're horrible people in every job. Um, whether we can do without it takes another one of those leaps of the imagination. Um, you know, we'd have to stop measuring. We might have to develop different ways of trusting each other. Um, we might have to go back to our notions of you know, trust and honesty, different types of social contract um, that mean that we don't have to have 20,000 student evaluations to work out for doing their job. You know, we used to say, we always have to do student evaluations, and you say, well, I... I, I kind of read their exams, and that seems to be quite a good way of evaluating what's gone on. <laughs> um, um, so, that, uh, so I think we need to we need, probably need to be bold and just refuse. This is my, my, my this is my you know, maybe this bit isn't for UBA, but don't do the admin guys. <laughs> Go and do something else. Go and read Beckett. Um. 
One more? Or, yeah. or I'm fine, because there's this lady here. Yeah, okay, one more yeah. question. <laughs> no, then we're near, yeah. I'll be quick. It's really sort of carrying on from what you've, the, the previous question, and what I've been sort of toying with all the way through, through uh, inspired by a really um, interesting talk, is the, you know, the links really between political economy and these things. And I, I've noticed you carefully avoid <laughs> talking about it. Yeah. Um, but it, it's one thing to call something administration um, but it but it is really a political economy, yeah. and when we think of the um, awful case of the man from the Caribbean who'd been living in Britain for forty years, mm. paying etc cetera, etc, cetera, and then suddenly you know it was because of money that mm. he wasn't allowed mm. to yeah. have his cancer mm. treatment. Yeah, you know, so it is you know it is a system of political a new system of political economy yeah. that we have to think about that might work hand in hand, you know, with other, yeah, um, concepts of identity. Mm. But it's ha how we back up in a different concept of identity, I think. Mm. Yeah. But it's also, this will be my last point, that's, that's absolutely right, but also um, why that original vision for UEA, which was around inter you know, interdisciplinary knowledge, and it wasn't just because we were kind of greedy, <laughs> we wanted to do everything. It was actually the idea that in the 60s there were real problems and you, you needed to have different perspectives in order to, to actually develop real solutions to those problems. And I think we're now beginning to reach out to that again. You actually, you know, you need the history, you need the imagination, but you need the economists in the conversation, you need the policy people. And most of us are quite happy to do it. It's just as um, the woman in the front was saying, we need to sort of, you know, resist those administrative streaming that don't want us to do it. Um, but I do think, just to my last sort of raw UEA moment, um, you know, that, that's, you know that's, where, that's why UEA was founded. We were very, very good at it. You know, dev, creative writing, um, wham. Um, and, you know, I think we're quite well positioned to be, you know, to take that conversation into the next, next stage. Thank you for a good question. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, you may not have been able to solve all the world's problems <laughs> this evening, uh, but I think everyone here uh, will have gained new insights uh, which have sprung from your sort of unique combination of bringing to bear uh, literature and history in a way which genuinely illuminates uh, problems today and illuminates the contemporary world. Uh, and as you yourself were making the case, it shows how humanities can have uh, a real impact in the world today. Um, so I'd like uh, to ask the audience to, to join me in thanking Lindsay uh, for a marvellous tour de force, which I'm sure we've all enjoyed. Thank you.